we will get started. Um, hello and welcome this afternoon to what is going to be an important and hopefully inspiring conversation. We're really thrilled by the number of folks that expressed interest in, in joining this topic. So thank you to everyone for being here. My name is Sarah Strader. I am an active duty Air Force spouse. I'm also the founder and the director of the Secure Families Initiative, and I'm going to be your MC for today. Uh, behind the scenes, I'd like to acknowledge Kate Marshall-Lord, who is my awesome teammate here at SFI. She is being our behind the scenes producer today. If you do have any questions, if for some reason uh, audio or video stops working for you, uh, please go ahead and, and stick that in the chat and I'm sure Kate will be able to get you sorted right away. Uh, because we have so many new folks joining us today, I'd like to briefly introduce SFI. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit program whose goal is to mobilize military partners, family members, and veterans to be voters and advocates for themselves and their communities. Why? Because, as we will talk about today, we have seen what happens when policy decisions are made in absence of our input and the outcomes leave much to be desired. At SFI, we believe this is particularly the case for issues of war and peace. Um, our country has been at war for two decades and that burden has fallen squarely on service members and their loved ones. And that is why we advocate at SFI for a diplomacy first approach to foreign policy, uh, because we believe that investing in the non-military tools in our foreign policy toolkit is actually the best way to keep our service members safe and their families whole. So we hope that you, everyone on this webinar, will join us in our really important organizing. Uh, and I'll tell a little bit more at the end about how you can do that. But meanwhile, let's get started. Uh, here's a little roadmap for how today's event is going to go. We are very lucky to have Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey's 11th Congressional District here to give us some keynote remarks. Um, after that, our incredible panelists, Sue Hoppins, Stephen Peters, and Mallory Sharp are gonna hop on and share some of their experiences. But first, we are going to hear some opening remarks from one of our SFI volunteers. Erin Anhalt has been an active duty Navy spouse for over 21 years. She is a mother of three children with special needs, and she is a member of the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma. Erin has become a dear friend of mine and a fierce advocate for a lot of the issues that we share. So Erin, the uh, virtual floor is yours if you'd like to join now. Thank you, Sarah. You, uh, you made me cry a little. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today and to give the opening remarks for this panel of military spouses who are using their voices and skills to enrich America. I especially am thankful to be um, here with Representative Cheryl, who has done such great work in New Jersey. We are all better for the work that the Congresswoman and our panelists have done. And I'm sure many military spouses across the globe will join me in saying thank you. I, I love America. It sounds cheesy, I know, but I do. I, I love her hope and vision and I love the freedom that we have here. I also recognize her flaws. It's because I love America that I feel compelled to speak out about her flaws and inequalities. It's because I love America that I cannot remain silent as we make mistakes that harm our fellow citizens and people around the world. It is because I have spent my entire adult life, over 21 years, serving our country as a military spouse that I feel even more compelled to speak out and use my political voice and vote to correct the wrongs of where we've been and where we are going. Military spouses are too often depicted by the media in a very narrow way. First of all, we are almost always depicted as cisgender women married to men, or we're either greeting our husbands on the, on the bow of the ship after deployment, we're attending a sporting event where our service member surprises us during halftime, or we're being handed a flag graveside by a Marine. We are expected to fill the role of passive travelers whose lives revolve around our spouses. That's not who we are. We are a complex and diverse group of people. We aren't a monolith, not by a long shot. I've known military spouses who are women and men, spouses who are gay and transgender, white, black, Latinx, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and Sikh. 
I have spouse friends who are stay-at-home Christian moms who homeschool their kids and they don't really wear denim jumpers anymore. I don't think that's still fashionable, but um, I also have friends who are passionately secular and they intentionally enroll their kids in the most diverse public school every time they move. In 1830, the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek was signed and my ancestors started the walk from Mississippi to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. Ashatasia. Yes, I am Choctaw. I am a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. My ancestors were robbed of their homelands and forced on a brutal journey from Mississippi to Oklahoma. My grandmother was taken from her family and sent to an Indian boarding school where she was prohibited from speaking her language and subjected to abuses too horrifying to recount. The vision the government had of Indian boarding school was to kill the Indian and save the man. It is because of my family history that I am firmly grounded in the understanding that my country has deep flaws that need to be mourned and reckoned with. I also strongly believe in the hope that we have the promise of freedom and the opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity that is lacking in too many places around the world. My American story goes far back beyond the first European settlers, and it was later enriched by Irish, Italian, and Welsh ancestors. My roots in this land are deep, and I am both confident in the future and aware of the blemishes of the past and present. It has been suggested for years that military spouses need to be silent about political issues. We've been told that it could be harmful to our spouses' careers or that we need to stay silent so we don't cause any harm or waves in our communities. However, that silence is most often suggested by those who benefit the most from the status quo. I don't have that luxury. I know as a Native American that we, if we do not speak up, we risk being erased entirely. As a military spouse, I've seen how not using our political voices has resulted from, in our absence from important political conversations. We have an obligation to reclaim our presence and use it for the benefit of our families and our country. This goes far beyond just voting. The voting is fundamental, but not every military spouse can vote. We have many military spouses who are immigrants, who are just as patriotic and loving toward America as we are. They just can't vote. For the rest of us, it is not the only political activity we should embrace. Military spouses have a wide array of experiences that enrich America and make us better. We are impacted by foreign policy decisions and military actions, and we must demand a reinvestment in diplomacy first foreign policy and a reinvestment in the State Department. We are impacted by burn pits that have left our spouses with debilitating illnesses or cancer, and we end up being their primary caregivers. We are impacted by our spouses being sent to wars, often to the same war over and over and over, only to watch them suffer from PTSD for years, too often losing their lives to this trauma. We are impacted by the inequality that is present in schools and when we have to move every few years and help our children adjust to schools that are unequal. Our voices are critical to all of these discussions and our stories paint a more complete picture. Our experiences and understandings of what happens in the aftermath of choices made by those in power should be shaping the decisions they are making. We owe it to our country our service members, our fellow military spouses, to advocate for better wages so none of us are living in poverty, to advocate for better schools across the country so that our children aren't getting wildly uneven educations, to advocate for stronger housing regulations across the board so that no Americans are living in homes infested with mold, to advocate for gender equality so female service members in particular are no longer subject to sexual harassment or assault at work, to advocate for LGBT rights so all families can choose if they so desire, to advocate for racial equality so that our black and brown service members and their families aren't fearful when they get pulled over by the police. We must use our voices to call for diplomacy 
and peace so our spouses and children are safe. Military spouses protect and defend the Constitution just like our service members do. And we take that responsibility very seriously. And it's time we start raising our voices just as seriously. Thank you again to Sarah for your vision in starting an organization that is designed to empower military spouses and ensure we're equipped for the responsibility at hand. And Kate, who's working alongside making all of this possible, your vision and hard work make all of us better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us today. It is now my privilege to introduce our guest of honor, Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Cheryl served for almost 10 years of active duty service in the US Navy, first as a helicopter pilot, then as a Russia policy officer. Following her naval career, Cheryl then entered law where she worked for the US Attorney's Office in New Jersey. She now represents New Jersey's 11th Congressional District in the US House of Representatives and has been a stalwart champion of diplomacy first foreign policy during this her first term. Congresswoman, we look forward to what you have to share. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you for hosting this really important discussion. I was on a Foreign Policy for America call last night and got to briefly chat with you and, and tell you how much I was looking forward to the event, and it's great to be here today. And, and thank you, Erin, for that really powerful opening. Um, I, too, love America, and I also agree. Those of us who deeply love this country feel compelled to constantly work to make her better and to ensure that everyone in this diverse nation can enjoy the promises of our nation at her best. I'm always happy to talk about issues facing military families, but I'm especially glad to be talking about them with the Secure Families Initiative. I think the way our defense and foreign policies impact families is too often overlooked, and our families have too few people sitting at the table to advocate. Our country rightly celebrates and honors the sacrifices the men and women of our armed services make for our country. But our military families face difficult sacrifices too. Spouses and children, I, I know you all know this, often get thanked at change of command ceremonies uh, or retirements. But too many times they aren't in the room when issues of op tempo or deployments or war are being discussed. It's so important for your voices to be heard. And, and I, I was side texting someone on my team about you know, what a great perspective Aaron was bringing to these issues, especially now because our country is grappling with so many challenges. This Congress, which includes the diverse and, and, and I know you guys aren't going to think this, but by congressional standards, young class of 2019 has wrestled with some historic issues. We were the first class ever to enter in the middle of a government shutdown. We've conducted oversight, fought to lower the cost of prescription drugs, protected America's open spaces and led during the COVID-19 pandemic. During this historic two-year period, I think we've made some important strides on issues related to military families and veterans, and that is in no small part due to the focus of our veterans in Congress. For example, the National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year of 2020 included crucial reforms to the military housing system. It's probably the last group I need to point this out to, but on-base privatized housing has been in need of urgent upgrades for years, and service members and their families have needed more leverage, better housing options, and stronger voices in the military's housing decisions. The FY 2020 NDAA made huge progress in that regard, including millions in funding to fight hazards like mold, asbestos, and lead paint in military housing. None of that progress would have been made without military families advocating for themselves and their loved ones. The FY 2020 NDAA always also repealed the Survivor Benefit Plan, Dependency and Indemnity Compensation Offset, which will put more money in the hands of the loved ones of our service members. These survivors, many of them Gold Star families, deserve every benefit we can give them. It is unconscionable that it took Congress so long to repeal what we've called the widow's tax, but I was proud to support the efforts that led to its repeal. The necessity of that repeal was made real to so many members of Congress simply because of the stories they heard from military families across the country. The work of supporting military families and veterans is far from finished. 
Military families face challenges ranging from paid family leave to child care to professional certifications for spouses. When I was in the Navy, military spouses were often too far down the list of priorities. As we all know, military life requires frequent moves often in places where military families have no connections, no outside community, and few job options. Professional certifications are a key example here. A military spouse, spouse with a law degree could pass the bar and say Washington State, as a friend of mine did. She, her husband was stationed at Whidbey Island. She worked hard through law school, passed the bar only to move to Norfolk and, and have no ability to practice. I became an attorney after I left the Navy, and let me tell you, the bar exam is not an experience I'm eager to repeat, so it's a high bar to get through. We see this issue apply across the board, nurses, teachers, doctors. After each move, new certifications are needed, new expenses are incurred, and more time is invested. For many jobs, this comes with less job security, less seniority, and fewer benefits. For military families with children, this stress is amplified by arranging schools, child care, and dealing with the adjustment for children living in a new and strange place. Both Congress and the military itself have taken steps to address this problem, including by enacting the Portable Certification of Spouses Act in FY 2020 NDAA. But we have to do more. Our culture has moved forward in many families. Both parents are working. and some, both parents are serving in active duty roles. Removing any hurdles they face in pursuing active employment is the very least we can do. But even if we removed all of those professional hurdles, every parent's first concern is for their children. As we all know, military jobs are demanding and time consuming. Service members and their families deserve to know that their child is safe, educated, and cared for. And I loved Aaron's description of why it's so critical that we support good education across this country. I know that my good friend, Chrissy Houlihan, who serves with me in the house, chose to separate from the Air Force because of a lack of affordable and accessible childcare. Beyond base care where she served had a long wait list. This forced parents to go to the open marketplace, which was often far too expensive for those on a military salary. Unbased child development centers are extremely valuable resources for military families and must be fully funded and staffed. I was outraged when this administration chose to reprogram money from the CDCs and military schools to pay for its border. On the Armed Services Committee have advocated for restrictions on that type of reprogramming action, and I will keep fighting to ensure that the well-being of the children of our military is not put at risk due to fund unnecessarily political, unnecessary political maneuvers. I'm also deeply concerned with threats to the military healthcare system. TRICARE and the VA are both struggling to find doctors, and families without access to a nearby military treatment facility are seeing their costs increase. Adding insult to injury, the Defense Department was, until very recently, considering a 2.2 billion cut to the military health system without adequately explaining how they were gonna care for families. While that cut was defeated, the fact that it was considered at all, especially during a pandemic, is surprising to me. Service members and their families should be able to rely on readily available comprehensive health care, whether they live on a base or in a remote rural area. I've always fought for robust military health care and I'll continue to do just that. I don't want to sound like there hasn't been progress. There has. I'm extremely proud of NDAA for fiscal year 2021. This year's bill included several important provisions uh, for service members and their families. It authorizes $40 million for impact aid to educational agencies that serve military dependent students. It sets in motion a study on the feasibility of allowing military spouses to make thrift savings plan contributions and authorizes a pay increase for service members. All these provisions were made better and stronger by the voices of military spouses themselves. When I came to Congress, I co-founded the Service Women and Women Veterans Caucus with the three other female veterans in the House, Chrissy Houlihan, Elaine Luria, and Tulsi Gabbard. Our caucus works to address problems facing the largest growing segment of both the military and veterans communities, women, looking at everything from military sexual assault to access to quality and affordable health care. We formed the caucus because we knew that service women and women veterans needed to have their stories told in Congress. And one of the things our caucus pushed for this session was making sure that TRICARE covered 3D mammograms, the standard of care when it comes to breast cancer screenings. In December of 2019, TRICARE announced that policy change. I'm also very proud of the Four Country Caucus, a bipartisan group of veterans in the House who've come together, regardless of party ties, to advance legislation that works for the good of our service members, their families, and our national defense. I say all of that to say this. 
your advocacy is needed. Your voices are needed. All of the progress this Congress has made would not have been possible without military families themselves speaking up, demanding to be heard, and providing their insight and experiences. Most members of Congress haven't served in the military. Many members haven't had a loved one served in the military. We need to hear from you. The veterans and active duty service members and families who I hear from in the 11th district make me a better representative and ensure that I'm focused on issues happening on the ground. I know all of the changes I've outlined today are well known to you, so think of this as a call to action. Call your members of Congress, tell your friends and families to call there, share your stories, write letters, and we can continue to make progress. Thank you again for having me here today. It's really been an honor. Thank you so much. And I can't imagine a more uplifting call to action than just that, hearing directly from a great leader like yourself about how we can be most effective. So thank you so much. Um, if I may, can I ask one follow-up question, if that's all right, oh, and then we'll, we'll let you get off to more important things. But I am curious, since the theme of our event today is, you know, going past the kind of um, surface level understanding of, of what a veteran and military family life looks like. I'm curious if you wouldn't mind just briefly reflecting on how your service experience as a veteran has shaped your priorities uh, as a Congresswoman. I know you've, you've laid out a lot of the things you've worked on, um, but maybe just one comment on how that's kind of informed your decision making. Well, I wouldn't underestimate expressing to people outside of the military what the basic level, what it basically looks like, uh, not just for service members, but for family members, because we just have so few people in this country who serve, and so many of us in service have done so uh, because, you know, we have a parent or a relative in service, so we've become, um, what, what we're afraid of becoming is this warrior class that's apart from society, and that's not just bad for society, it's bad for the military. We need those connections. Um, and so I think it is important for all of you to tell your stories. Uh, you know, when we're, we, we talk a lot about veterans, and I would even say, uh, or military members, and I would even say so many in Congress need to better understand what that life is like. But I mean, we don't talk nearly enough about what it's like for the family members and what it means to be a family member of someone serving. And I think what's compelling, you know, what compels myself and Chrissy Houlihan and Elaine Lurie, we have served and we have children. Uh, Elaine served with a child. Um, Chrissy and I had gotten out. Chrissy got out because she had children and because it's so difficult. And I think that compels us to act in this area. Uh, believe me, um, as a husband who works uh, or having a husband who works, it's hard enough balancing our jobs without having to move when he said, okay, I got new orders. You know, and to then say, oh my, how am I gonna continue my career? Um, so. So these are all really critically important things to express and discuss. And again, personal stories mean so much, I think, to legislators. But I would also say, kind of to your point, it's critical, I think, to have the, the way my service, the way my experience uh, impacts my, my time in Congress and my thinking about Congress. I know people who have PTSD. I, I know people who have lost so much um, by going to war that I don't take war lightly. I, I, I'm concerned that we're in, you know, what some of us call these forever wars, that, that people's parents served in the same war that they're serving in now. Um, I do think it's critical that we look at how we are going to safely get out of Afghanistan, get out of Iraq, but leave those countries stable and secure. Um, we can't simply pull right out, but we also need to have a path towards that. So, so these are critical issues. And, and, and I think of these because I know the impact these wars have. It's not theoretical. It's not just some testimony I've seen in Congress. It's close and personal friends who've experienced it. And I think that's why it's so critical to have people that are familiar with the military serving in Congress. Um, I think it's too easy to be outside the military to have never served or to never have a child at war and to just send other people's children to war. And, and that is something that um, greatly concerns me. When I was born in 1972, we had 70% of Congress had served and right now it's under 20%. So, um, so that really does critically inform my, you know, my th thought process and I think other veterans in Congress now. But thanks again, Sarah. I, I really, 
I, I really do appreciate it. I think this is such an important discussion. And, and so thanks for letting me be a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you for your generosity of time and input. Oh, thank we you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thanks. All right. And with that, uh, we are grateful for the Congresswoman for setting us up for what I expect to be a fantastic discussion. And now it is time for the main event. I uh, could not be more thrilled than to convene this fantastic panel uh, of military veteran and spouses who uh, I know I have learned a tremendous amount from already and I hope to pass along some of their lessons to you as well today. I'm going to give each panelist an introduction. We're going to add them onto the screen. Uh, I'm going to be uh, asking lots of questions in order to guide this discussion. Uh, and if we have time, we may open the floor to some Q&A. Um, but I will warn you in advance, we've got a lot prepped. So please don't get your hopes up just in case we're unable to get to that. Um, but let's get started. So our first panelist is Sue Hoppen. She is the founder and president of the National Military Spouse Network and the spouse of a retired Air Force officer. Welcome, Sue. Hi, guys. Next, we have Stephen Peters, who is a Marine veteran, the spouse of a recently retired Marine, and the Director of Communications and Marketing for the Modern Military Association of America. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks, Sarah. Great to be here. Thanks. Uh, we have Mallory Sharp, who is a Program Coordinator and an Active Duty Air Force spouse of five years. Welcome, Mallory. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And of course, I am the moderator. I am also the spouse of an active duty enlisted Air Force uh, an airman for about five years. So apologies, Stephen, but in terms of branch representation, we definitely have you outnumbered today. Uh -oh. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you again. And I am going to kick us off with an open question that I hope gets us all warmed up. Uh, what motivates each of you to get involved with the political process, whether that's voting, advocating for policies, protesting, or even helping some campaigns? Why do you feel it's so important for you to participate? And I'm going to let Sue go, and then Stephen, and then Mallory. First of all, thanks so much for convening this conversation, Sarah. I'm really thrilled to be here with you guys and I appreciate the opportunity. And the Congresswoman, she is such a great leader and I really appreciate her comments. She clearly understands her lifestyle. So um, that gives me a lot of comfort. Um, two answers for you. One, clearly representation, right? As um, Congresswoman Cheryl said, the number of veterans in Congress, she said was 20% is at a low point, which means that less people understand our lifestyle and challenges. So our elected officials need to hear from us. They need to hear what our challenges are and what our experiences are and where the gaps are and where the opportunities are. Um, our experiences and um, the solutions that we bring to the table need to be reflected in the policies that are drafted and implemented. We need to be part of that process and drive the change that's needed. And you know, I think it's as simple as if someone asks you for your advice, if someone asks you for input, give it. Um, I think that's what drives me. I think it should drive everyone because um, we might be shy and think that we don't have anything to offer to the greater conversation. And it, that could not be any less true. Um, we absolutely have something to offer. Second, and this is my guiding um, principle for everything, is I think that America is best served by an all-volunteer force. And decisions to get in or stay in are usually made around the kitchen table, which means military family issues, such as military spouse employment, become national security issues. You know, when less than 1% of the population currently serves and less than 8% have ever served, we need to keep all the people we can. And you know, um, service members should never have to choose between doing what's best for their nation and what's best for their family. So crafting great policy that allows service members and their families to stay in and continue to serve their country um, is in the best interest of everyone. And that's um, what gets me involved. Well said, sir, uh, Sue. Um, I just add, I, I really believe that we have a, a responsibility as Americans to be involved in the political process. You know, democracy only works when we're all engaged in that process, whether that's through voting, which is an absolute must, or through advocating for better policies, helping campaigns, or even, yes, through protesting. Um, Protesting and voting is especially rele relevant right now as we've witnessed really some truly horrific things over the last few years from 
you know, from kids being separated from their families and put in cages at the border to the gassing of peaceful, peaceful protesters outside the White House uh, for a photo op, um, to transgender service members being unfairly targeted for discrimination with a military ban. It's really absolutely critical that we make our voices heard and hold our election or our elected officials accountable at the ballot box. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and echo what both Sue and Stephen have said. Um, I think that our participation is absolutely necessary. And if we don't participate, how are we going to be represented? And if we don't participate, how can we be upset or disagree with the decisions that are made on our behalf? Um, so like Congresswoman Cheryl said, I think our advocacy is necessary and it is powerful. We've seen how powerful it can be. And she openly invited us to get involved. So like you said, Sue, if someone asks for your advice, don't turn them down. <laughs> In the title of today's event, we made a reference to feel good photo ops, uh, which are the typical depiction that we see ourselves in when it comes to political and cultural communications. Um, another term that gets used a lot is uh, reunion porn, which can describe the homecoming videos we all know that can be really beautiful and powerful, but also risk romanticizing what can be a tenuous and even painful transition point. Um, in the meantime, not nearly as much of attention is of course given to the home departures, let alone any of the time in between. Why is it so important for us uh, who have either formally served or have loved ones who uh, have served and continue to serve um, to show our neighbors and fellow voters the less glamorous parts of the lifestyle, um, the reality of what our lives look as outcomes of the policy decisions? Um, what understanding gets lost when our identities are oversimplified to something like a feel good photo op? Uh, and this time we'll start with Stephen Mallory and then Sue can take a break from being the first speaker. Sure, and it's true that, that those feel good photo ops don't accurately reflect the complexity of military life. Um, on the other hand, it's a good thing that the public appreciates the service of, of our troops and the sacrifices that they and their families make. And that appreciation is often on display in, in those moments, but what does get lost or oversimplified is the, the truly hard work that goes into dealing with the incredibly complex reality of being separated from your loved one for such long periods of time over and over and over again. Um, it's just in deployment after deployment, service members often spend years away from their families. And what the general public, I don't think often fully understands is that significant amount of time away causes tremendous strain on families and, and their relationships. It's no wonder that divorce rates uh, for military members who have been deployed are so high. Um, look, we devote a, a tremendous amount of resources into equipping service members with what they need to go to war but we have to do a much better job in ensuring those very same service members really have the tools they need when they come home to reintegrate with their families and, and with society as a whole. And not just the service member, it's their spouses and, and their family members. They also need help to work really through those unique challenges and strains. I think Stephen is spot on. Um, it just overshadows the complexity of being a military family. Um, and when we glorify the homecomings and ignore the separations, we just erase all of those struggles. Um, and we ignore that parent who became a single parent for six to nine months at a time and had to struggle with that daily load of everyday life. And we ignore that that parent had to quit their job because there was no childcare available on base and you're at an overseas installation where you can't go off base because there's no openings there either. Um, if that spouse had employment to begin with, right? So uh, we're also ignoring the family that's left behind is lacking in commissary uh, savings because of those budget cuts. And they're trying to make it on the single income of an airman, an E3 or you know an E4, an E5 even. Um, and then we ignore the fact that those returning members and their families are lacking in access 
to mental health care professionals because we have a lack of mental health care professionals in the military and we have a lack in the TRICARE network if you're trying to go off base. Um, so these televised and feel good moments, they're awesome. You know, it's, it's great for people to say thank you for your service and we appreciate you and I appreciate that and I'm sure most of us can agree that we appreciate that. But what I'd appreciate more is people having an awareness and an understanding of how these policies affect us and how that seven days at a time and trying to get our families adjusted to having someone not there for those amounts of time and missing football games and missing sporting events and missing the parent-teacher conference and not seeing how those day-to-day -day activities are affected. And I agree with you guys. And I think um, my fear for all of this reunion porn and all these great um, opportunities where, you know, like the uh, TV operas and everything is that I think Americans start to think that that is our experience. Like that is what American um, families, military families do is that when there's a homecoming, we're all celebrating. And when there's a, you know, a happy occasion, well, if they're going to graduate, obviously someone's going to fly the mom or dad back in and it's going to happen at the last minute when they don't understand that that's the exception, not the norm. Right. And that is like for every person that you see on television, there's hundreds of thousands of other families that don't get to experience that. So I almost think that lets Americans off the hook because Americans are busy. We're going through a pandemic. Everybody has their own issues. There's job losses everywhere. We're all struggling to feed our families. Why should they care about military families? Especially if they turn on the TV and there's a military family being celebrated or you know they're being given things and they have access to healthcare and all this other stuff. When these renewing, you know, like these shots, these like tiny slivers of our lives, start to look like our whole life. And that starts to, for a lot of Americans who don't understand our life, that starts to be representative of what they think our life is. Um, and so, I mean, I, I love a good reunion video just like anybody else, but I don't run the risk of thinking that's our whole experience. And I worry that everybody else does. And I think that's, that's the fear is that um, people just start thinking that this is representative and it becomes like that yellow ribbon or like the magnet that you stick on your car and forget about it. And I would rather have them really think if I say I support the troops, well, then what does that really mean? Um, watching that video doesn't really support anybody, right? I mean, great for that one family, but um, I, I hope that Americans really are able to bifurcate, like, um, feel good reunion porn with actual support for the troops and their families. And a, one of the under uh, unknown or overlooked aspects of the real life, not just that one snapshot, that one sliver, um, if you're a military partner in particular, is the chronic challenge of un and underemployment, which I know has already been uh, briefly mentioned, probably because it's close to home for just about every one of us on this call. Um, but I, I thought it would be particularly um, insightful for our audience if we if we touched on it. Um, you know, with, like like has been mentioned, when you move around a lot, when your partner gets whisked away to work, whether it's a deployment or even if it's if it's not, but just you know high ops tempo uh, work too, and all of the caregiving, all of the household responsibilities, all of a sudden fall upon you. Um, that can obviously make it really difficult to have a fulfilling career. So much so that some of us have to I don't know start our own nonprofits to give ourselves a job. It's hypothetically. So <laughs> I know each one of us, like I said, has faced this, and so I'd wonder if we could all reflect on some of the ways in which. Uh, better understanding might reflect actually better policy. So let's start to demonstrate what would it look like um, if if we were in in the room where it happened at the table. Um, I am going to have Sue start if that's okay because I know that this is your policy area of expertise and then we'll go Mallory and Stephen. I mean I think um, I'm interested in hearing Stephen and Mallory's experiences because like they actually feed right into some of these challenges and one is the demographics. I think in order for effective policy change um, past, you need to understand the demographic that you're hoping to serve. And they can't do that without dat outdated data. And a lot of the data that is driving a lot of the policies and a lot of the programs that are being um, introduced in DOD are from a report that was done in 2004 before the advent of um, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, before the advent of telework or before the rise in entrepreneurship with military spouses. So if you're formulating programs based on outdated information, you're not really serving the current force. 
um, I was hoping to see Stephen go, yeah. <laughs> you know, like we just need to really count the numbers of who we have in the force right now, um, because I think that the policies would actually change. And until we do that, no policy is going to be close to what we need to support our um, population. Um, the next is understand that military spouse employment issues are different than veteran employment issues. The biggest difference is that by virtue of having transitioned out of the military, veterans are no longer subject to directed moves, unlike military spouses. So generally speaking, that means that military spouses are looking for jobs or moving their businesses every 18 months to three years. Effective policy is going to have to take that into account. And when you look at big umbrella programs like we have at the SVA or with um, entrepreneurship, a lot of those kind of make the umbrella veterans and military spouses and expect our military spouse um, challenges to be covered by that, which is not true because veterans, um, let's just take the example of a new nonprofit or a new business. They have the luxury of being able to build a business like anybody else to scale. A military spouse knows she's gonna have to shutter those doors and move that business in three years. So they're building businesses that they can scale eventually. But that, you know, so it's a very different experience. And finally, it doesn't have to be difficult. Some of the policies that already exist can be expanded to include military spouses. A prime example of this is expanding the work opportunity tax credit. Um, you just need to include military spouses as a target work group. That would incentivize employers to hire military spouses. Some of the groups that are already included are veterans, rehabilitated felons, and some are youth hires. Surely military spouses rank in there. And I can't wait to hear what Stephen Mallory has to say, so. <laughs> it's, well, I consider myself fortunate because my spouse informed me about the priority placement program early on in our marriage. Um, but I know that I am a minority in that aspect and not everyone is aware of that program and not everyone knows that they can utilize that program. Um, I was shocked to find out that the military spouse unemployment rate is six times higher than the civilian unemployment rate and that even when we are employed, our pay is uh, approximately 26% lower than our civilian counterparts. Um, but that we have ways to mitigate these shortfalls when we have such a diverse spouse network uh, with all of these specialties and degrees and, and licenses. And we have the MyCAA to help people get those licenses, but they have contracted that to uh, by, by rank. And it was meant to be utilized by everyone. So why can't we open that back up and have that fully funded to extend that to anyone who's looking for those ed education opportunities? Um, and we have the, the reimbursement for a relicensure now, but it's only up to $500. And it doesn't account for anything other than the monetary compensation. So we're not considering how much time you have to study to relicense in a different state or study to, to pass a, a bar like the Congresswoman mentioned. Um, so we know that we have these ambitious and talented spouses and we just need to utilize them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you guys have hit, hit the nail on the head. Almost every military spouse will tell you how incredibly difficult, difficult it is to maintain, let alone build a career. Every two to three years, it's time to move again. And uh, so many of us have to give up our local jobs if we were lucky enough to get one in the first place and try to really reinvent ourselves. It's just a constant, constant struggle but it's also a struggle that makes us very resilient because we know how to adapt and overcome, uh, even if it's because we had no other choice to do so. Um, you know, while remote work may be ideal, it's often just not an opportunity for many. It's true we may be facing a, a new normal uh, of work situations due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's still true that uh, those remote jobs are highly coveted and few and far between. They just aren't easy to get and therefore aren't an option for many. Um, we've, as we've you both talked about, we've done a great job on starting to highlight um, employment opportunities and preferences and focus employers on the importance of hiring military spouses. You know, there's a whole host of efforts that have been underway from the Obama Biden administration's joining forces program and so many others. But we, we really do have a long, long way to go. 
Sarah, may I add something as well for the other side for the policy? Well stated, Mallory and Stephen, by the way. But um, I think for the um, congressional members and their staffers, another way to affect um, change and also um, pass good policy is to talk to um, service members and spouses, right? Like to actually go where they are. And it doesn't have to be difficult. Like I know in October, there's going to be a Congressional Military Caucus Summit. And, you know, they're bringing experts to the Hill virtually, but, you know, so there are existing mechanisms that will allow them to, you know, actually get in front of military spouses and the experts who are working these issues and actually learn, instead of just throwing spaghetti on a wall and seeing what sticks, they can actually listen to what's going on, where the challenges are. So yes, listen to the constituents, but understand that the constituents are away, they're anecdotes, right? So they reinforce what you think you know, or they bring an issue to you, but like they're, so many military serving organizations and VSOs out there that this is their job. Like this is what they do. They eat, breathe, and um, these issues. And so they they understand the resources they have, the data to back up the policies that are required. So I think that all the elements are there to craft good policy. I don't think that um, people on the Hill necessarily know where to find those resources. And I think that's the missing piece. And so I would encourage them, you know, whether they use their um, military fellows or just anybody in their office that has been here for a while, like just look for those resources and reach back to people who understand the issues instead of just, like I said, throwing stuff on a wall, see what sticks. And if you're a military spouse that wants to participate in a storm the hill, you should take one of our trainings. We talk a lot about how to effectively yeah. lobby elected officials. So you're right, Sue. All the tools exist as long as everyone takes advantage. Um, all right, let's have some real talk here. So there are certain assumptions uh, that we're all familiar with that people sometimes have when you tell them that you're affiliated with the military in one way or another, um, that you must fit a very specific mold when it comes to your beliefs and values. And while we all, to a certain extent, share, of course, a shared commitment to service, uh, when it comes to most of the other stuff, we are as diverse as the communities that we come from. Um, I'll just share one personal anecdote where I came up across this. So last summer I was in DC, I was walking around with a newer acquaintance and I was telling her about this project, SFI, how I wanted to advocate for a less militarized, more diplomacy first approach to foreign policy. And she looked at me quizzically uh, and she asked with, with all good intentions, she said, but don't people join the military because they want to go places and kill bad guys? And that really stung because, of course, families' motivations to serve cannot be, are not that simple, universal, or frankly, aggressive. Um, but, you know, that's a stereotype. And I, that's just one example of, of course, many that exist. But um, for my own personal edification for the next time that I run up against this, uh, what advice do each of you have? for ways in which we can chip away at some of those stereotypes and in doing so, reclaim our narrative of what it means to be a military family member. Uh, at this point, I will let folks raise their hand when they want to speak, uh, when the power moves you. I'll go. <laughs> well, I mean, you are just 110% correct. Well, while service to our country and you know supporting our service members builds this common bond, you certainly can't put every military spouse or, or family into mold. We just come from all walks of life, from backgrounds and political beliefs, and we truly are as diverse as the fabric of our nation. And it, it's ludicrous, uh, some of the stereotypes that we've been labeled with, whether they're you know, reinforced through movies or an outright lack of understanding about what military service means. And we, we have to reclaim our own narrative and I believe military spouses and veterans really have a crucially important part to play in that. And for example, while uh, service members are often sometimes restricted in what they can and can't say and do in regards to politics, their family members and veterans are free to fully exercise those constitutional rights. And it's no secret that their sacrifices uh, for our country often give veterans and military, fa military families uh, a level of credibility uh, and trust and respect by the general public. So we have a tremendous opportunity to persuade others and often by simply sharing our own stories and how political decisions impact our lives and our families. 
one, you know, you don't have to look any farther than the, the fight for marriage equality. Uh, LGBTQ military partners and spouses, we were key voices in that fight. And we won that fight because we helped to open the public's eyes to the discrimination and disproportionate challenges that we faced simply because our relationships weren't recognized by the military. Um, and the landmark decision ensuring uh, loving and committed same-sex couples finally had the right to marry. I believe it was uh, Justice Sotomayor who specifically referenced how marriage inequality harmed military families. Um, so I say all that to say military spouses and family members and veterans, we have a powerful role to play in politics and advancing our values as a nation. Um, and we really can reclaim our own narrative. Oh, go Mally. So, <laughs> um, I think that this ties back perfectly to both your initial question of participation and the feel good photo op questions, because for the civilian population with no ties whatsoever to the military, like Stephen said, where do they get their information? It's from movies, it's from TV shows, it's from this reunion porn that we see online. Um, so they see this patriotism and this, you know, we're, we're hitting the ground running in the boots and the sand and we're in the war zone and that's what they see day to day and they don't see anything else that goes on behind the scenes. So I think that changing the narrative has to start with us becoming involved in our own communities and our own elections and our own policies. And we have to influence how others see us by being involved. Uh, otherwise we'll always be viewed with these stereotypes that people who have never been in this community have placed on us. And so I'm going to take like um, the in the weeds um, point of view, or the every person point of view. And, you know, it's interesting you know, for um, people of uh, minorities in the military, even for military spouses, it's interesting because people approach you with, um, you know, preconceived notions. And it was always interesting because they always asked me if I was really grateful that my husband saved me from some kind of life because he married me. And I'm like, well, um, I just came out of college <laughs> like we met in Denver so I don't know what you're talking about and so it was really interesting because I felt I felt so inadequate that I thought I had to develop a narrative that fit into what they expected of a military spouse and it wasn't until I realized that that was the exact wrong approach that it started you you know start to become comfortable in your own skin and so I think in hindsight what I would say is don't be shy about sharing your story and experiences and don't water it down because you think you need to fit into some stereotype or narrative. And um, that's just from personal experience. Um, we can all make a difference by being willing to have that thoughtful conversation with people who are curious about us. And I think um, it's not easy. It's not always gonna make you popular, but if you come from a place of authenticity, I think that resonates and they'll walk away with maybe a little bit more curiosity. Like she's an odd duck. They can't be the norm. Like, let's go talk to some other people. In the, and, then, and then they start to realize, okay, it's really diverse. Like, you have this odd person, and then you have this, um, you know, you have this liberal person, progressive person, you have this conservative person. And then I think they, um, you know, they start to learn that we're diverse, because I don't think we're going to change anybody's minds. Like, I, I think me sitting in front of someone telling somebody, we're diverse. We are. We really are. They're going to be like, okay. Um, I think it's just through experience. And so I think we all play a part in that. It's as simple as just having a drink, having a conversation, and just being your authentic selves. And like, they'll figure it out. And there's powers and numbers, right? When yeah. we organize together, it, you show that, yeah, you're not just the, the exception to the rule. Yeah. Uh, so last January, uh, tensions between the United States and Iran were sky high. And there were moments where it felt like our country was about to head to uh, yet another war. Uh, and I know that that was a flashpoint for a lot of military families that I know personally. Um, there were some who were really concerned about the safety of their loved ones. And a lot of us really felt in the dark about what kind of strategy was driving this administration's actions that uh, felt like it was putting us in such a dangerous position. With that in mind, as we look to the future, uh, what do you all think that principled leadership from the top looks like? Uh, and why is it so especially important, especially for military uh, families, that we elect higher ups whose vision and judgment we can feel confident in? 
Uh, and in this case, uh, Mallory, would you like to kick us off? And then we can go Sue and Stephen. Sure. Um, I think I, my main word for this and principled leadership is just transparency. Mm -hmm. um, I think that as military members and families, we deserve to know our leadership's intentions and their plans and their goals. Um, you know, we have these, if anyone's ever been around uh, like a squadron or a group, the minute that they get into that position, they set out, this is my vision, this is my mission, these are my goals, you know, I have this 30, 60, 90 days, I'm going to look at this and we're going to change these things. And it's all very open and transparent. And I think that if we can have that at the squadron level, the group level, why can't we have it at our elected officials level? where we're putting these people into these positions to reflect what we as constituents want. Um, so having that confidence in leadership is essential because it's the difference in feeling safe and feeling at risk. Yeah, you are spot on, Mallory. And um, I thought about the words that came to mind when we thought of um, principled leadership and I came up with integrity, character, moral, shared values, servant leadership, and the hubris to surround yourself with and listen to experts and knowledgeable advisors. Like, I think that's what we all want is the knowledge that, um, the faith that when these decisions are being made that experts and our generals and our admirals and our senior enlisted advisors are being taken into consideration, right? Because they understand the force, they know what's at stake and you know the views of the State Department and everywhere else. I think it's really important for military families to know that we have a commander in chief who will act in an ethical manner. Um, we need to be able to trust that decisions are being made in the best interests of the nation. Um, you know, I, I don't think that people join the military because they have political aspirations. I think they join the military to protect our country and our way of life, and they just want to do their jobs. Um, they don't want to be in the uncomfortable position of having to question the, um, you know, the decisions of the commander in chief. So I think that, you know, principled leadership reflects all those values that Mallory stated and what I just said as well. Yeah, you're both absolutely right. And uh, I just add that I believe it's really critical that we have elected officials who either truly understand or truly appreciate uh, the impact of their decisions. I mean, leaders who don't just use service members and their families as political props, uh, but know what it means to have your loved one sent off to war, not knowing if you will ever see them again, or know what it means to have a, a member of your family risk their very life for decisions that they are making. And if I can, um, I'd like to briefly brag on Mallory real quick because you brought up transparency, Mallory. And I just loved, I know you shared with me how you uh, started a, a, a transparent channel of communication between uh, some of the military leadership at your base and spouses and family members directly. And I just loved it when you shared about that because we're so used to relying on our service member to hand over the information, which may or may not actually happen. And I think that was just a great example of, you know, innovation that you, and, and initiative and leadership on your part. So gold star Mallory. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple uh, questions in the Q&A uh, that look good if the group's ready to improvise. So uh, first we've got any thoughts on how to make our stories newsworthy to the public in the midst of COVID-19? Um, I think this is a really, a really good question to ask. Um, and Sue, my turn to brag on you a little bit, because I attended the Storm the Hill training that you hosted and MSN hosted earlier this year. And this was one of those points where we had to, you had to be honest and, and recognize that when we talk about especially issues of unemployment, which now are affecting a lot more Americans than usual based on the economic ramifications of this pandemic, it takes an extra level of nuance to approach an issue um, without looking insensitive. Um, so anyway, it, does anyone have any thoughts about ways to kind of break through with newsworthiness about um, the issues that are so important? Well, I'd just say that I, the fact that you're a military family uh, already gives the situation you're dealing with a lot of credibility and newsworthiness. Um, because you're a military family, uh, because a lot of Americans know that we really have a, a sacred responsibility to take care of military families because of what they sacrifice. So just the fact that you are a military family gives it a lot of newsworthiness. Uh, 
Uh, so I just encourage you to, to go for it, whether it's writing an op-ed or reaching out to a reporter to tell them what's going on with you and how it's impacting you. And I think you'd be surprised how uh, newsworthy that they would consider it. Um, and I also think that um, based on what we've heard and what we've tried is um, start with your local papers. And Stephen, you can back me up and say yes or no, but um, start with your local papers because a lot of times the national um, papers will look, reach back to the local papers to get their, um, you know, their articles and their op-eds and such. So don't feel like you need to reach out and start with the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, your county paper or something is a good place to place those op-eds. Um, and keep trying. Um, you never know what is going to be of interest. And also don't forget the military outlets because they also, I mean, it seems like we're um, projecting to ourselves in a stovepipe, but you know, like other people source the military outlets for um, content as well. So be persistent, start small and just keep at it. Persistent and keep at it, same thing, sorry. <laughs> and I think depending on the stories that this, this question is posed around, it could be uh, in addition to COVID, like I know many deployed members who have been stopped from coming home because of COVID or are TDY and haven't been able to go or have had procedures delayed because of COVID and because of the response to COVID. Um, I know personally, my husband had a medical procedure delayed because of this at another military installation. So we're not even allowed to do those sort of things. So um, it, it could just capitalize on the circumstances happening. Good Great point. point. We've got another question here. Uh, is there a role for parents in advocating for military spouses and their families? Um, being asked by Diana Clark, who I know is a military mom. Thank you, Diana, for asking that question. What do y'all think? What, are, what role can, uh, can parents play? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's all about empathy and getting people to understand your point of view. Uh, and the public can understand what a parent is feeling and dealing with, uh, with, with their service member being deployed or and there's the challenges that they're facing. So 110%, yes. Yeah, they're allies. They're our best allies, right? And chances are they have probably lived in their town for longer than the service member or the spouse. So they're um, a constituency um, that you know can also share with their Congress people like, hey, I'm not personally invested in spouse employment issues, but I care about this issue. So you should get involved and you should vote for this. Um, so absolutely, the more the merrier. This is not one of those things where we are only gonna carry the water for ourselves so that less than 1% is gonna make anything happen. No, <laughs> we need all of you. I, think, I, just, yeah, I tell my mom, everything. Uh, we have a great relationship. And for others who have a relationship with their parents, I think it's really easy for them to, to say, you know, I empathize with this. This is my child and I want to fight for that. And we've seen what parents can do. We've seen what moms can do around this country. So I think that's, I mean, why not? Absolutely. We, and as a transient constituency, we are always looking for the folks that ha are more geographically consistent <laughs> and might have that, that in. I appreciate you mentioning that, Sue. Um, all right, I think we've got time for, for one more question, and I'm going to loop in part of what someone asked with the end question that I had prepped anyway, so it'll be a nice little collapse ending. Um, Oh, actually, sorry, we did have one just come in that's interesting. Um, because we're an all volunteer military, oh yeah, okay, this is a good question. <laughs> because we're an all volunteer military, oftentimes people might not be empathetic because we signed up for it. Um, so the, I think the extension there with the question is, how do you respond when someone says, but this is what you signed up for? Um, spoiler alert, I did record a Tidbit Tuesday video responding to just this. So another reason why folks should follow SFI on social media is we do talk about this stuff um, regularly. But I am curious to hear from you three. Have you ever faced that? Has someone ever kind of responded with that? Uh, and if so, you know, how does that make you feel? How do you navigate it? Wait, I kind of want to know what Sarah said first. <laughs> Well, I basically, okay, uh, my response is no, I did not know <laughs> that this is what I signed up for. Uh, I personally did not grow up in a military family, so the reality wasn't known. But even, there was an actually a military spouse I know who grew up as a military brat, and even that didn't prepare her for the experience of being in the military now, 
because of the endless wars that we're fighting. The ops tempo that our families have been expected to shoulder are unsustainable, right? Uh, one former commanding officer of ours said that surge has become standard. Uh, and I think that really points out how being in the military now is just such an unknown entity, even for previous generations. Um, so it's an epistemic issue from the from the face of it. But just because and, and even as you might know, in general, what generally to expect everyone's everyone's experience turns out differently. None of us know what assignments we're going to get or what family circumstances will evolve as it happens. Um, so I, I don't give a lot of sympathy when I'm told that, but I can, I can at least understand where it's coming from. I'm going to take the unpopular stance. Um, a lot of times when military spouses tell me that they went to a job interview and they were like totally discriminated against because their military spouses and the questions, I just come back to them and say, but would you want to work there knowing that that's their stance? Like, if you know that that's the way they feel about military spouses, why do you want to work there? Um, and, you know, and I, I know that might sound cavalier because people are like, well, because it's a job. And I'm like, I think they've already made the decision. I don't think they're going to hire you. And so I don't know how much you staying at the table and continuing to have that conversation is really going to be to your benefit or they're, I, they're not listening to you. And so I think if someone says, but you signed up for it, to me, they, I've, I already know that there's a chip on their shoulder they have um, a bias and they're not prepared to listen. I might push it a little bit and say, what, you know, what do you mean by that exactly? And, but I'm, I mean, I just pick my battles and that doesn't seem like a battle you can win. Yeah, and so you hit the nail on the head. They, just by asking that question, they've already shown <laughs> where they're coming from, what they're entrenched in and they're not gonna budge. <laughs> so uh, there's not, I mean, for most instances, you're not going to change their perspective, I don't think. But uh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. And if the master communicator says that, I'm taking that to the bank. I mean, we can try. <laughs> I think with the signed up for it, it, it's kind of, I believe in leaving everything better than how we found it, right? So just because we signed up for this life doesn't mean that we can't try to make it better. We right. can't try to make it better for ourselves. We can't try to make it better for others. We can't address the issues just because we signed up for it. I can still advocate for changes and, and betterment in the military and in DOD. That's, yeah. That's a great, that's a great addition. Okay, final question this time for real. <laughs> so the question we've gotten asked from the audience is, how can we combat the fear of speaking up and the impact that it might have on a military career. And, and I'm collapsing that with the question that I had prepped, which is just, you know, you all, everyone here in this panel has had the experience either previously or currently today of being, of being married to someone who you love and care about and want to succeed in the military. And knowing that there are lots of horror stories out there about, you know, oh, if I, if I speak up, if I'm too political, what's gonna happen? Um, this is one of the biggest hesitancies and fears that we've of course heard from folks. So I would love it if we could close on a note where the panel gives advice, um, kind of course of action. What, what do you do if this is, um, it feels like a barrier for you? How can you, how can you overcome it? I'll go first. <laughs> I'd just say, do it. I mean. Do it as if your life and your lives and your family's life depends on it, because it literally does. Uh, do it as if the soul of your nation and the fundamental values that we believe in are literally at stake, because they are. Um, I think, to paraphrase what uh, Speaker Pelosi said this week at the DNC uh, convention, uh, do it not just to decry the darkness, but to light a path forward. It's really critical. critical. Love that. I mean, I, and I would say that, you know, you might be a military spouse, but you're also a member of society. And as Americans, I think it's part of our civic duty to be engaged, um, to vote and to hold our elected officials accountable. You can't just sit back and let someone else tell your story. But I understand the fear and I was very worried about that as well. But one thing that we did do um, was I, I wanna manage expectations between myself and my spouse. Um, and so we would talk about these things, like say, hey, I really wanna get involved with this. If it makes you uncomfortable, I won't do it. Not because it's gonna get me in trouble, because like we're married and we're, we're making a decision as a team. 
Um, so I think if you understand your right left boundaries in terms of the comfort zone for you as a family unit, then you can choose to ignore it or not. And then you can move forward in the way you want to. And I don't say that because, you know, um, hey, you're going to kowtow to your service member. Not at all. I think that's just respectful in a relationship where, you know, you understand because if you think your biggest fear is it's going to impact the other person, we'll have that discussion and see if they care if it impacts them or not. They may not care at all. Or they may say, well, there's certain things that I don't care if you get involved with because um, it won't affect me at all. But these things are kind of tangentially involved. So if you are going to do it, maybe consider this. Um, and I think it's just being respectful in communications and managing expectations and then have at it. It's your responsibility. It's your civic responsibility to get engaged. I think just like Sue said, before you're a military partner or affiliate, you're an American citizen. Um, and there have been way too many people who have fought for your right to vote and to advocate and for your right to be seen and, and heard for you to feel like you can't. So as long as you have that open communication with your spouse and they're fine with it, um, you know, limitations on, on participating in politics don't exist for family members. The Hatch Act covers federal employees and there are AFIs and instructions for all branches that cover military members, but there's nothing for the family. So as long as you and, and your partner are on the same page, I absolutely, because we have to be heard as military members and families on our own behalf. I love Maureen's comment in the chat where she's like, my spouse told me to speak up that he could handle any butt backlash. <laughs> she's a veteran, a gold star wife and a blue star mom. Nice. And my best answer to that question is to just say thank you to the three of you, because I think each of you in your own way has answered this question by being out there as bold advocates, as people who speak their minds and their hearts. You each have done a tremendous amount of job in your everyday life, as well as on this panel today at, at paving a way for others to do the same, at normalizing civic engagement as in fact a good thing for us to do. So thank you to all three of you for being such awesome examples and for being generous with your time today. I, I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. I'm thank fantastic. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you too uh, to Kate Marsh Lord in the background, my awesome teammate uh, who has been graciously uh, producing this video for us today. Thank you. Um, and of course, thank you to our audience for joining. This is a busy week with lots of competing events. So the fact that you carved out this much time for us honestly speaks volumes. Um, and I just want to close by saying this isn't the last you're going to hear from us here at the Secure Families Initiative. From now through the end of the year, in addition to our regular advocacy, we are determined to ensure that every military and veteran voter will have access to the ballot box and that each ballot gets counted. That's why we're in the process of launching a military voting coalition with other orgs that include NMSN and MMAA. Uh, to work together on advocacy and outreach on that issue. Um, that's also why you can get a lot of superb information about voter registration, absentee ballot requests, and ballot return options, both on our website and on our social media. So please make sure if you're not already, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That is the best way to keep up to date with how to vote in the era of COVID. Uh, we also have a volunteer court at SFI. If you want to go the extra mile, you can sign up on our website, securefamiliesinitiative.org. Uh, and finally, we couldn't do what we do without generous financial support. So if you are in a position uh, where you're able, please consider donating to our work and making conversations like this possible. Um, you can also do that through our website. All right, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you again to our panelists uh, and everyone out there. Please stay safe uh, and vote this November or September or October, whenever ballot day is for you and your absentee ballot, make sure you vote. Uh, and thank you so much for participating. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>